Well, good Tuesday morning, everyone. Glad that you tuned back in because I want you to continue listening to our pastor, Stacy Wood, as she's talking this week on transforming relationships from a recent sermon. And I know it's going to bless your life. But before we go to her, I want to uh, remind you or let you know about this afternoon, Clubhouse 7 at 5 o'clock, we're having our monthly evening of food, fellowship, fun, and faith. And I invite you to come out and join us. We're having free hot dogs, barbecuing them. And then just bring a salad or dessert to share. It's a potluck in that way. But we're going to give you hot dogs tonight. Clubhouse 7, 5 o'clock. And then we have a musical treat with the trio called Lake House Trio. Fabulous group where they're going to play 50s, 60s music where we can sing along just have a fun night tonight, and uh, I think it'll bless your life. Come on out. It's free. Love to meet you and see you there. So let's get back to Stacy Wood and transforming relationships. What I want to do is read our focus verses one more time today. And as I do that, I want you to listen to it through the lens of how should my relationships be impacted when I follow the way of Jesus. So we're gonna look at Romans chapter 12, starting in verse nine. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. I love how practical God is with us. Like that, that's like a chunk of scripture that it's like, okay, it's almost like a list. Like if you, will, if you will do these things in your life, your relationships will be transformed. There's so much great content in there. Honestly, we couldn't cover it all in one sermon. But what it, I think that what's so interesting is how Rome, uh, Romans chapter 12 starts off with this charge to us that we would not be conformed to the way of the world, but that we would be transformed. And then the rest of the chapter is basically giving us step-by-step instruction on what that looks like practically. In this particular section, Paul starts off by saying, love must be sincere. Love must be sincere. Love is really at the heart of the message of the gospel. Love is at the heart of the kingdom of God and everything else flows out of that. It's the most central part and it's the driving force behind every other component of the gospel. I would even go so far as to say that love is the central and the most important virtue in all of scripture. That's a very strong statement to say to identify one thing, love, as the most important and the central virtue of all of scripture. But I wanna support that with some other scripture. So if you were to look in Matthew chapter 22, when Jesus is asked, what's the most important commandment? He replies back, it's to love God and to love people. Most important thing, loving God and loving people. If you were to look over in 1 John chapter four, you would read the words, God, is love. So in his very essence, core to his identity and who he is, God in his very nature is love. Now the thing that makes that so powerful is to think that also God is holy. God is just. So God is not like just some friendly grandpa that winks at mischief. Like there's a holiness to God. But without the holiness, it wouldn't be a true form of love. Without the justice, it wouldn't be a true form of love. God in his nature is love and all of his intentions of his heart toward you are love. That's an amazing thing to think about. Jesus says over in John chapter 13 that love is gonna be the most compelling thing about us and that the whole world will know that we belong to him, that we're his disciples by the way that we love one another. So think about that. That's crazy to think that the most powerful and effective evangelistic tool that we have is the way that we love one another. So the Bible begins in Genesis chapter three with a wedding 
And it ends in Revelation 19 with another wedding. So this entire book, it's the story of a lover who is heartsick for his beloved and the way that God just pursues the one he loves with such intensity and that God is jealous for our love to be for him and for him alone. It's a story of love. In, in the New Testament, Jesus really raises the bar by calling, introducing this language of family to the church. So no longer are we just people that attend the same church. No longer are we just friends or acquaintances, but he actually calls us brothers and sisters. And he invites us to love one another with that level of loyalty. So love is the central and most important virtue in all of scripture. And I love what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says here. He says, Christian brotherhood is not an ideal which we must realize. It's rather a reality created by God in Christ in which we may participate. So this Christian community, these transformed relationships, it's not just some ideal that, oh, well, that would be really nice if that's the way it was. No, no Jesus said, you are brothers and sisters. And our level of participation in that is up to us. But I would suspect that if we took a poll right now and asked how many of you really feel that level of kinship with one another, like that level of devoted relationship and community, most people would probably say, I'm not experiencing that. And so you got, it begs the question, why? Like wh why, if that's the vision, if that's the picture, why aren't we experiencing that kind of love? I think one of the problems is how diluted the word love has become. Like it's very overused. It is a word that we use to mean a lot of different things. When I say the word love, you might think of a thousand different things. Maybe you think of romantic love, like the kind that movies are made of with passion and drama. Or, or perhaps when I say the word love, you think of being nice to people, like being kind. That's a loving thing to do. I found some t-shirts that talk about what some different people love. So there's one that says, I love my dog, which I totally get because I also love my dog. There's another one that says, I love tacos. That's, that's a common love. And, but the question I do have though is, how can we say we love something that we're planning on ceasing to exist? Like we're, I'm about to consume that. I'm about to destroy it, but I, I, I love it. Okay, I love cycling is the next one. So like we love our hobbies. Um, this last one that I found is I love naps, Netflix, and long walks to the fridge. <laughs> Obviously worn by someone with a very compelling vision for their life. <laughs> but we love all kinds of things in all kinds of different ways. And that's, that's one of the reasons why it feels so confusing that what, what is what is this kind of kingdom love that Jesus is talking about and how do we experience it? So what I hope to do today is paint a picture of a different kind of love, like the kingdom of God kind of love. It's, it's different than this culture kind of love. Because if we're supposed to be kingdom people, like in Matthew when Jesus is giving us instructions and he says, seek first the kingdom, well, we gotta be really clear on, on what does that even mean? What are the kingdom values that we're supposed to be seeking? You know, the ultimate litmus test for our own spiritual growth and maturity, it's not how much we say we love God, and it's not even how much we come to church or how passionate we are during worship. The ultimate litmus test to our spiritual maturity is how it's fleshed out in our relationships with other people, how it's transforming the way that we live, our attitudes, how much the fruit of the spirit is evident in our life. That's the ultimate litmus test for our spiritual growth. So as my love for God increases, my love for people should also be increasing at the same level. But I don't always feel that. <laughs> I don't know about you. But sometimes I'm like, God, I really love you. People, a little bit harder. Like I'll, I'll spend time with Jesus and I'll be like, oh Jesus, I just love you, Jesus. I just love to spend time with you. These other people are getting on my nerves. They annoy me, Jesus, but you don't annoy me, Jesus. I like spending time with you. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son.